Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for watching today's Black History Series presentation titled 19th Century African Canadian Artists Reimagining Blackness in Lived and Imagined Landscapes with PhD student Adrian R. Johnson. An independent art historian and scholar, Adrian holds an MA and BFA from Concordia University and is currently a PhD student in art history at McGill University. Adrian's current research is focused on African Canadian and African diasporic landscape painting from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So I'm going to pass it over to Adrian, who's going to uh, start her presentation. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you so much. Thank I'm very, very um, honored to be here and I'm very excited. Um, thank you so much. Um, and for that lovely uh, introduction. So I'm just going to skip right into it. Um, basically, my discussion is a, a is taken from my thesis research, um, and the um, introduction of it has is is a pretty good way to, um, I think, frame a little bit what my interest is and some of the stakes that I feel are very important. Despite be being a fact of the Canadian landscape since as early as the 17th century. African Canadian artists active as late as the 1980s and earlier are sharply underrepresented in Canadian museums, classrooms, and classrooms, easily positioning Canadian art, its collection, diffusion, inclusion, discussion, and representation as a critical site of redress of the nation's legacy of anti Black racism. Canada's artistic can canon and discourses customarily represent and or allude to Canadians, uh, sorry, Canadians and Canadian artists of African descent in spatially and temporally fragmented ways that perpetuate longstanding stereotypes and fallacies about the African Canadian presence and culture. Specifically, that African Canadians are a recent phenomenon to Canada since around the 60s that African Canadians, but recently participated to visual culture, as historically, African Canadians were not participants or stakeholders in the production, collection, or diffusion of fine art, or even decorative art. Traditionally, if persons of African descent are alluded to or included in Canadian museum exhibitions, art discourses, and pedagogy, it is overwhelmingly within one of the three following geotemporal temporal contexts. Either from objects of the ancient Egyptian period, presentations of traditional sub-Saharan African objects created as early as eight, uh, sorry, eight Christian era to the early 20th centuries. And it's also worth, no worth noting that the vast availability of those objects to Western audiences in Western museums is due to colonialism and the entitlement of white supremacy over African peoples, which in turn justified the centuries long mass removal and hoarding of innumerable African creations from the continent. And lastly, African Canadians are often referred to or alluded to through art by noted African-American, African diasporic, and African-Canadian contemporary artists. And the caveat to the latter is that if African-Canadian contemporary artists are presented, it is unfailingly work created as of the 1990s and not art created. Social conditions and aesthetics influence African Canadian art. Could the inclusion of African Canadian arts artists in discourses of Canadian art from World War One and earlier contribute in fostering, um, sorry, in fostering improved conditions and relations for African Canadians? If anti-Black racism is endemic, what does it portend for African Canadian space making and national belonging? These are a few questions that inform my research and my uh, forthcoming um, or in progress dissertation project on early African Canadian artists. Specifically, 
my research, uh, my research and dissertation focus on African Canadian placemaking in Canadian art and in life through engaging with spatial aspects of anti black racism and racialization in Canadian art to explore how African Canadian artists active from 1850 to 1914 navigated lived <clears throat> and psychic landscapes of anti blackness. Indeed. While I previously stated African Canadian artists active since the 90s and earlier are deeply underrepresented in Canadian art and its pedagogy, my decision to focus on artists active during the mid 19th and uh, into the 20th centuries is because the period allows for a, 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 a very rich engagement with African Canadian life and artistic practices at this period that is not among the plethora of pathological less analyses of African Canadian communities, largely found in the realms of sociology, history, or in legal fields. Inspired by the coincidence that my three case studies were African Canadian artists that uh, painted landscapes, I employ landscape as hallmark genre and subject of Western fine art and as geographic terrain as a framework from which to examine the psychic and lived aspects of African Canadian cultural belonging, agency, and the processes and impacts of anti-Black racism as fine artists and as Canadian citizens. In 2012, when I was quite fortuitous to become the first to uncover the earliest five surviving and unexhibited paintings by Nova Scotian artist, but pardon, by African Nova Scotian, Edith Hester MacDonald, later Brown, whose dates are 1880, sorry, 1886 to uh, 1954, who I argue is the earliest known African Canadian female artist I was immediately struck by how ubiquitous and powerful the word landscape is. It is among the more compelling and stimulating terms that simultaneously encompass our imagined and lived terrains of human experience. It is so uh, frequently used in language to connote a site, a vista, to characterize or identify a state of being, or even to describe the condition of a situation that it, 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 sorry, that it elicited the following question. How often do we, people, conceive of spaces of human activity as multiracial and ethnoculturally diverse, diversely populated? In Demonic Grounds by Catherine McKittrick, um, a black, uh, which is a black feminist e examination of blackness and issues of anti-blackness regarding place and placemaking Canadian society in the fields of geography, cultural geography, uh, uh, sorry, and uh, geography, law, and in um, issues of gender. McKittrick employs the notion of wonder in relation to blackness in the Canadian context to char characterize the par paradoxical visibility and invisibility of blackness within Canada's lived and imagined landscapes. This consequential and persistently fragmented understanding of and engagements with blackness in life and in and in the human imagination is is precise that oh sorry in the human human imagination that McKittrick interrogates within Eurocentrically dominant, dominant socioeconomic contexts speaks particularly to my experiences as a Canadian of African descent specializing in Canadian art in Canada. I came to study art history in 2010, inspired by my three years experience as a self-taught independent curator of emerging and professional African Canadian um, contemporary artists 
um, perhaps I was motivated and equally blinded by the symbolic promise of racial justice signaled by Barack Obama's historic achievement as the first African-American president of the United States of America. But nothing quite prepared me for the confusion quickly followed by embarrassment and wonder that I experienced upon noticing the first and only example of African Canadian art presented across 13 weeks of lectures in my introduction to Canadian art class, which was an undergraduate level survey course featuring diverse uh, visual art forms produced by Canadians in Canada from the pre-colonial period into the new millennium. The first work shown of an African Canadian artist was Dan Douglas's 1996 video installation, Nootka. Exploring aspects of storytelling, uh, storytelling perspectives, colonialism, and colonialism, the pensive and poignant six minute, 45 second single channel video installation features a view of a shoreline of Nootka Sound in British Columbia. And the only indication of people manifest through audio of over overlapping voices of an English captain and a Spanish commander. That moment was quite bewildering and if I must admit, offensive, not only for the ways in which Canadian art pedagogy seems to have suggested in that course that African Canadians had little to contribute or little value or little value or little interest in fine art or decorative art. And I really stress decorative art because um, there are so many objects that I've come across in heritage museums across Canada where indeed there are examples of, of elaborately designed wood cabinets and 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 bed frames and and all kinds of tables and and even smaller objects like baskets woven baskets that were um, passed down within families across like seven and eight generations um, and none of those none of those are commonly accessible or even brought into um, classroom discourses. <clears throat> The moment was also quite disturbing because of the ways in which the African Canadian art, um, the way in which African Canadian art from the mid 20th century and earlier was completely absent and thereby performing multiple forms of cultural erasure. Particularly, troubling to me of that experience was noticing the ways in which African Canadian art is absent and how the absence of African Canadian art performs perhaps unwittingly in perpetuating the very racist stereotypes European colonists created in justification of African enslavement and to later capitalize from racialized social disparities since the abolition of slavery. Settler colonial logics of African slaveability and anti-blackness, um, according to Andrea Smith, frame persons of African descent and those having dark pigmentation as synonymous with inferiority and remain influential in how European and non-African uh, descended people are perceived and treated. Contrary to the alluring big tent veneer of the art world, the Eurocentric hoarding of high art and culture remain potent, potent tools within white supremacy. More, is, it's more, they are easily overlooked in Western constructions of high culture, taste, and fine art, particularly the fact that they emerged against the backdrop of the horrendous globalized enterprise of African enslavement. The linking of Eurocentric notions of human and civilized to high culture by the 17th century 
aided Eurocentric discourses to perpetuate the idea that Africans lacked the ability to create fine art, which was also used as further justification of African uh, people's alleged um, ignorance and their alleged uh, status as non-humans, all, all of which served as rationales for the enslavement, oppression, and brutalization of African people. As noted by scholar and curator Andrea Fotona, quote, art came to stand as one of the higher intelligences in the raciology of the colonial globe, and it became a means to rob black peoples of their humanity. In focusing on, in focusing on the contributions of African Canadian artists and African in Canadian art history, I aim to reveal the ways in which Eurocentric colonial systems not only hoarded culture, but leveraged associations between so-called Western high art and civilization. These aspects have yet to be included in relation to discourses, uh, uh, discourses of, of African descended artists in Canadian art. As noted by Ronaldo Walcott, quote, what it means to be human is continually defined against black people and blackness. That anti, oh sorry, end quote. That anti-blackness is normative in the most basic, uh, the most basic elements of human engagements is among one of the reasons countering anti-blackness is so hard. Blackness has been cemented in generation long associations of Eurocentric hegemonic discourses that the color black is negative, which is also why my research aims to, to avoid focusing on the dominant black-white binary and appeal to a discourse that engages non-black communities to reflect and consider the ways in which anti-blackness happens to benefit them. So on landscape, um, the mid, uh, landscape and art, um, roughly 1840 to 1900. The mid 19th to early 20th century is categorized as the golden age of landscape painting in Western art. Although the natural world has been recorded in art since antiquity. It was not until the end, uh, sorry, the mid of the, the mid 17th century in England in the waning years of the Georgian era into the Victorian era that landscape as art and as soci socio-political concept took passionate cultural hold and the natural world became worthy as a central subject in painting. This movement also spawned popular interest in animal genre, animal genre and still life painting. <clears throat> Until being elevated to an accepted genre in Britain in the late 18th century, landscape ranked low among the hierarchy of the genres. During this period, Britain's imperial might, uh, political and economic, and economic soared as a result of a successful campaign of heightened colonial trade throughout the Americas, the Caribbean, and Asia. This, along with the blossoming rise of the industrial age, contributed to an increase of national wealth and a powerful new white middle class. Imperialism's profoundly limited understanding and respect for non-Eurocentric societies gravely affected, affected the movements of, of African peoples throughout North America. Bookended by slavery and racist stereotypes, the presence of African Canadian, African people on Canadian soil acutely highlight the contradictory Eurocentric cultural constructs of freedom and landscape insight and art. British colonial interests in the Americas provided some of the earliest naturalist, uh, sorry, earliest artistic views of Canada, either as cartography, survey, or landscape. While white explorers like military officers, settlement leaders, administrators, surveyors, government clerks, um, wives and or daughters, and members of the Christian clergy 
would comprise among the first progenitors of landscape painting in Canada, among the earliest and rare images of Black Canadians pictured is this image here, um, entitled A Black Woodcutter at Shelburne, 1784, by William Booth, Captain Lieutenant William Booth. Although it's, it's debatable as to whether or not this watercolor can be considered landscape painting, this watercolor of a Black loyalist cutting wood outdoors while stationed at the troubled Shelburne, uh, Nova Scotian settlement um, is another, it remains a very uh, great attestation to the, 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 the participation of African Canadians in Canada. So. British colonial notions of landscape had a negative impact on the experiences of African Canadians and, and notably their participation in African Canadian society and culture. Eva Mackey's article, Death by Landscape, Race, Nature, and Gender in Canadian Nationalist, Nationalist Mythology critically examines intersections between discourses and artistic representations of Canadian landscape and how those, dis dis those discourses and representations fuel lived and imagined understandings of Canadian identity, or as she would clarify or stress, more precisely, white Canadian identity. According to Mackey, defining a distinct Canadian identity was paramount over the 18th and 20th centuries, and much of those discourses surrounded around whether or not Canada was its own nation or an extension of Britain and its ideals. She argues that there is a core link between British colonial understandings of landscape as art, site, and national identity, and the status of non-white people, stating that, quote, symbols of nationalism are used flexibly to differentiate and define the boundaries of the imagined nation that fluctuates between defining so-called others, and nature as noble and or ignoble savages, or male and female, depending on the needs of the nation." End quote. Within this complex and highly stratified framework produced from a distinctly Eurocentric preoccup preoccupation with identity and social categorization, Mackey states, quote, women, the colonized, the racialized, and the working classes were perceived, therefore, as being closer to nature in oppositional position to men and to the elite, end quote. With this confounding structuring of ethnicity, place, privilege, and access, uh, and access designed and understood within a racial hierarchy of privileging, whites, it stands to reason, uh, uh, sorry, how persons of African um, heritage were consistently marginalized from participating uh, fully in Canadian society. In my brief um, attempt to uh, attempt to change the narrative and reimagine an African Canadian presence in African, in, sorry, in Canadian art and life, it is now my pleasure to briefly introduce you to two African Nova Scotian landscape artists, or should say artists, um, George Henry McCarthy, and after that will be um, Edith Hester MacDonald, later Brown. Born in Shelburne, Nova Scotia in 1860, George, Maca George McCarthy died in his adoptive home of Trinidad in 1906. <coughs> Excuse me. Information remains elusive regarding McCarthy's education and engagement in the arts. Yet, I argue that his stylistically naturalistic plein air painting, View, Town of Shelburne, dated 1885, which depicts an otherwise mundane day in Shelburne, is among 
the earliest known paintings by an African Canadian. In the Canadian context, the life and art of uh, sorry, the life and art of African American artist Robert S. Duncanson, whose dates are 1821 to 1872, stand as the premier example of an African Canadian artist. In fact, um, upon a recent visit to um, the Montreal Museum of Fine Art, I did see a description at, um, set beside uh, Duncanson's sunset study, um, indicating that he is of Canadian heritage. So I have to ask them what they know that I didn't discover. But I digress. Overwhelmingly identified as Canadian through his presumed Canadian roots, Duncanson stands as the most represented Black art artist in major Canadian museums in Toronto and Montreal. The, con sorry, the consistent assertion of Duncan's Canadian identity continues to prove the double cachet of having a person of color who was highly talented and a recognized artist of international complain, uh, sorry, uh, of international acclaim tied to Canada's art historical um, ethos. Yet the myth of Duncanson's ca uh, Canadian heritage presents a series of claims that merit correction. Where the Montreal Museum's, <laughs> the Montreal Museum's um, didactic um, presents, uh, states that Robert Scott Duncanson uh, has a, quote, Canadian father, end quote, Art historian and curator Joseph D. Kettner in his book, The Emergence of the African-American Artist, Robert S. Duncanson, um, published in 1993, provides compelling evidence that the artist was actually born Robert Selden Duncanson, um, circa 1821 in Fayette, New York, and was descended from free Virginian, uh, uh, free Virginian African-American slaves. With that in mind, it, with that in mind, I have come to, um, to argue that indeed George Henry McCarthy's, um, uh, sorry, painting, View, Town of Shelburne, should be recognized as a truly African Canadian um, artwork. And I am currently working on that, on Pedantes. <laughs> now, what is particularly um, interesting about um, McCarthy's um, painting, the only one known to exist, at least um, in Canada, is that this painting is an original work in oil, oil on, on board. Um, McCarthy's view of Shelburne um, is very much painted in, um, sorry, in the 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 scheme and period of uh, of the time of the nineteenth century with very highly finished brushstrokes. Um, I estimate that he painted this um, work when he was twenty five years old, and as is was standard with um, landscape paintings of the period. Um, a generous two thirds of the canvas is dedicated to the the air, the sky, atmosphere. Um, then the the mid ground is populated with a a realistic uh, view of um, Shelburne. Um, in fact, among the uh, houses and fields in the midground. You, we can find the Christ Anglican Church, which I can show better here. In fact, there are two landmarks that um, are visible here. Uh, to the left is um, the Black Loyalist Preachers Church, David George, the Shelburne Baptist Church, which is the oldest um, church. Uh, within the Convention of Atlantic Baptist Churches. And at right is the church I just mentioned, the Christ Anglican Church. 
um, that was um, uh, destroyed uh, by fire and rebuilt on the original site. Um, in terms of the Christ Anglican Church, which is located at its original um, original site at the corner of Hammond and St. Anne Streets. It is also um, worth noting that from these landmarks, it is quite likely that um, McCarthy painted this scene somewhere along Hammond Street looking north or northeast. So it's it's what's really special about this particular work is that it allows for a lot of 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 ability to try and trace the artist's um, steps and position at the time of creating the work. Produced in 1885, the uh, during the landscape painting's golden age, McCarthy's painting can be read as a testament to black endurance within Nova Scotia's rooted anti-Black society. I say this as this work was painted approximately 100 years prior to the Shelburne riots, which is the first recorded anti-Black race riot instigated by the town's white citizens in Canada. However, Although racism and racial segregation remain palpable um, in Shelburne um, and in Nova Scotia, ultimately until the 60s, um, blacks and whites have been known to work side by side within Shelburne's seaport economy. And the McCarthy family is a, a perfect example of this. Seven generations of McCarthy men would prove to be venerable ship and sail craftsmen, as well as highly skilled captains, sea captains. The McCarthy family roots can be traced back to 1811 through the surprisingly not too uncommon interracial marriage of McCarthy's grandparents, Hetty Dite, a black woman of whom little is known, and a white loyalist merchant by the name of Captain Charles McCarthy whose dates I am still, uh, have not found. Presumed to have been married for 19 years, according to the 1871 and 1881 Canadian statistics, as uh, our Canadian census, they had at least seven children, of which the identity and presence of three of their sons, George J. McCarthy, William T. McCarthy, and Charles D. McCarthy can be confirmed. In Shelburne, at the time of McCarthy's life, shipbuilding was a significant, significant area, uh, industry at that time. And these three sons in particular would prove to be incredibly success, successful mar maritime entrepreneurs, a legacy that would carry on through later generations of McCarthy's. Particularly, um, particularly when uh, George George McCarthy's um, uncle William T. McCarthy um, discovered a very uh, lucrative uh, pet uh, sorry petroleum bitumen deposit in Trinidad and Tobago. George McCarthy's African and European ancestry further raise questions regarding how, how non-Black Canadians understood and responded to racialized persons when their, when their identity was visibly um, ambiguous. With this in mind, many questions, uh, uh, many, for, many more questions arise, including were, was he able to attend art classes with, with, um, with other artists of European heritage? Did he, did he use his light complexion to that advantage? 
The mystery and the questions continue. I would like to now pass to introduce you quickly to the life and work of Edith Hester MacDonald, uh, later Brown. Sylvia Hamilton acutely reminds us that while, uh, quote, while race has been a major determinant of the black woman's status, gender has also sharply delineated her condition in Nova Scotian society, end quote. Unlike McCarthy, passing was not an option for McDonald, whose parents were of African ancestry and were not of light pigmentation. <clears throat> One of four children's two parents, Jessica uh, Brown McDonald and Thomas George McDonald, the family, the family lived a middle class experience. Her mother, Jessica, ran a general store, and Edith's father, Thomas George, was a porter on the Canadian Pacific Railway. In terms of economic status, African Canadian art, uh, sorry, historians Agnes Colest, Dorothy Williams, and Robin Winks observe that there was an air of prestige applied, uh, sorry, attached to employment as a railway porter, despite the brutal conditions and horrible hours these porters in, endured. A reason a majority of Blacks in Montreal and in Halifax, if were employed, if employed were quarters, was because of racially biased and exclusionary practices that effectively barred them from accessing better employment opportunities. While work continues in constructing a comprehensive picture of McDonald's life, <clears throat> interviews underway since uh, summer 2012 with the artist's only surviving granddaughter, Miss Geraldine Parker, a long-standing resident of Halifax, who had brief contacts living with MacDonald in her youth, has lent some very rich insights. MacDonald's birth uh, death certificate supports that Edith's, Edith MacDonald's birthplace was Halifax. And while the artist's grand granddaughter believes McDonald also spent time in Montreal's Plateau District, where she also believes McDonald received some artistic training, much more work continues in, in, in verifying those details. Most notably, the McDonald family um, lived in the area formerly known as Africville. And here are two images that always take my breath away. Um, at the left is, the, is an image of the uh, McDonald family home. And it moves me because of all the discussions of Africville, um, it has always been scenes of Africville in the most horrendous, decrepit light, as if to perpetuate and sustain the idea that, you know, people of African heritage don't care, they're careless, uh, you know, they're dirty, they don't know how to live. This is an early image. Um, I really haven't been able to ascertain the date. Um, um, I consulted with um, some uh, uh, some scholars with the Nortman, the Notman archives, and they suggest that it was, you know, in the 1900s or earlier. Um, and at the right is a image of the um, the McDonald family. And if I'm not mistaken, Edith is uh, at the left, at the very edge, um, just beside her baby brother and her mom holding uh, her uh, child. So known as Africville since, uh, 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 sorry, known as Africville approximately since 1850, 
The once vibrant all black community was home to approximately 400 residents, including McDonald and Edith McDonald and her husband, William Brown. Where they lived was initially named the Campbell Road Settlement. Settled between 1835 and 1840 by black refugees of the War of 1812, McDonald is a descendant of William Brown, who was one of the original eight families of Africville. Advantages to living in Africville included opportunities for port related employment and commercial fishing. Although residents held deeds and paid taxes to the city of Halifax as early as the 1850s, the people of Africville, quote, received no services and were forced to do with whatever was available, end quote. And that whatever was available namely included the adjacent, strategically situ situated city dump. Deprived of water and sewage, and given its growing rep reputation as a slum, Africville became known as the town, sorry, the town that begins where paved roads end. Further to the indignities and disrespect, including the city of, Hal city of Halifax's refusal to invest in paid taxes by Africville residents. Between 1964 and 1967, the residents were inhumanely expelled from their homes, their community raised to the ground, all for the city's infrastructure and beautification plans. The raising of Africville, which began with the destruction of the community church just as the community church was the focus of the Shelburne, the first thing, the first item to be destroyed during the Shelburne riots, the Seaview African United Baptist Church remains an open wound and a devastating testament to the systemic and institutionalized racism in Canada's history. Currently on the site of the original church, there is a newly built, though sufficiently smaller replica, which serves as a museum commemorating the Africville experience. Beside the reconstructed church museum is what is depicted here in the image before you, is now a fenced in dog park. A dog park has now taken over a space where children once played and family homes once stood. My research suggests <clears throat> that the, sorry, that the, that McDonald's four known existing landscape paintings dating from 1898 to 1906, are the earliest examples of work on canvas by an African-Canadian woman artist, executed in oil with highly finished near invisible brush strokes. Each painting is in, in its original frame. A common element of Edith's signature, Edith McDonald's signature, is that it consistently appears on the lower left or lower right of the canvases. My research suggests that McDonald's four known existing landscape paintings dating from 1898 to 1906 are the earliest examples of work on canvas and board by an African Canadian woman, executed in oil with highly finished near invisible brush strokes. Each painting is in its original frame. A common element is that uh, McDonald places her signature consistently at the lower left or lower right of the canvas. So here we have examples of her work. Uh, the first and earliest is a still life. Um, all the works are untitled. And the still life is uh, just on top the bowl of flowers. Um, her second work, 
is untitled 1899. And that is just the vertical painting in the center, that beautiful uh, winter landscape. The third painting is a landscape with animals. And that is dated 1901. And the uh, second to last uh, work is just at the bottom right called Untitled, 1906. And I consider this an animal painting. Though, yes, I, I, though I, I feel it's still a, a landscape scene proper in the sense that, um, you know, the, 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 no particular animals really uh, the, the main subject. It's rather the grouping in the space. And the last painting, Sweet Peas, dated 1911, is really, really meaningful to me because that was the only painting I was aware of by McDonald um, doing my research in trying to just assert that African Canadians participated in the fancy pants high arts. <laughs> and that painting, Sweet Peas, was the only um, uh, painting of the collection that was exhibited in a 1993 exhibition in Nova Scotia called In This Place. Um, and it featured a, a, a host of, 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 of uh, predominantly contemporary um, African Nova Scotian artists, but uh, that work was there and and it was a lot of phone calls trying to reach the curators and then finding someone who knew a friend of 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 uh, Miss Parker and and it was a lot of it was really fun in terms of the networks and conversations to try and track it down. So when I finally um, spoke of Sweet Peas over the phone to Miss Parker, when I finally uh, you know, contacted the steward of these works. Um, and I mentioned it. She said, oh, dear, you're at a loss. And I was, my heart dropped. She said, that one's been long lost, but I have four others. <laughs> Would you like to see them? And immediately all the blood and my complexion, you know, rushed back into my body because I was, I was completely um, unaware of the other works. Um, right. So to conclude, um, at least in terms of a, 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 at least to conclude with, with um, McDonald in terms of um, issues of respectability and how that respectability operates in black and white. Um, I think it's worth noting that Canada's participation in African bondage inured an extremely limited and bigoted construction of African heritage within the nation. Black women and men were above all valued for their ability to labor during Canada's French and colonial eras, uh, French and British colonial eras of slavery. This was a sentiment that continued into the 20th century through systemic race-based exclusionary education, employment, land and land ownership structures. Gender-specific gender -specific psychic and material impact of anti-Black racism carried by Black women and men of the African diaspora are directly connected to the Eurocentric reductive constructions of blackness and black people since slavery. In Unyielding Spirits by Maureen G. Eldersman, she contends that blackness became, quote, a, a badge of slavery, end quote, an attitude and social construct that, quote, regulated blacks, of, of blacks to inferior status and continued post-slavery in informing the proper place of black and people of color as domestics, railway porters, and custodians. 
Eldersman further points out that as a racially constructed labor system, Black women were profoundly affected by their day-to-day -day experiences. Positioned for centuries as objects of labor and sources for white male sexual pleasure, Black women were psychically and physically situated outside Canada's, he Canada's hegemonic, Eurocentric, and misogynistic constructions of respectability, femininity, and womanhood. Whiteness and white women were codified as and normalized as the ideal. In writing, up on, writing on the objectification of black female bodies, Charmaine A. Nelson succinctly observes, quote, once black women were seen as breeders, they were economically positioned as possessing in the biological sense the potential for an extremely lucrative payoff for their owners, end quote. Nelson continues, quote, rape was systematically used against black women within slave societies as a sex-specific form of punishment that benefited uh, uh, white slave owners through a violent sexual fantasy and reproduction of new slaves, end quote. The development of Black female identity was systematically stripped away through the inextricable linkage between production of labor and female reproduction. Lorena Walsh and Lori Carr note that female slaves were also herded into domains of the most menial or semi-skilled types of labor generally occupied by lower class white women. Female slaves, quote, rubbed swamps and meadows weeded corn and vegetables, cleaned stables, heaped the dung, spread the manure, and threshed the grains, and were responsible for their own home duties, end quote. Once slavery was abolished, the notion of respectability emerged fiercely among middle and upper class Blacks in North America during the mid-19th century. At the time, many Many uh, African descended peoples understandably thought that the abolition of, of slavery would allow them to participate in society as citizens and forge improved opportunities for themselves. Ironically, however, and as proven through subsequent years of enforced segregation, uh, forms of disenfranchisement, um, yes, forms of disenfranchisement, um, um, uh, limited gainful employment, these mythologies slowly came to fade. Ultimately, McDonald's work is an exemplary testimony of African-Canadian women and the legacy of African-Canadian female artists' creative contributions, aspirations, agency, and their intellectual authorship. In defiance to the social conscriptions of the period, and no less in a province with a distinctly charged and racially segregated culture, McDonald's paintings do not only exemplify how she saw the landscapes she portrayed, but illustrate how she saw herself in and navigated Canada's landscapes, psychically and physically. In 1914, MacDonald married William Henry Brown and on display at the African Film uh, Museum are three, li sorry, three linoleum landscape, landscape prints created by their daughter, Dr. Ruth Evelyn Brown Johnson who is a passionate community activist, teacher, and advocate. Um, which this, this continuation of, of, of passing down an artistic practice speaks to the inherent passion African Canadians have for the arts, for self-expression, and for the message their work can convey. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Adrian. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing this information. And I'm so excited for our audience to uh, listen and listen to what you've had to say and to see the beautiful art that you've shared today. So thank you so much.